title says it all, that's what I'm talking about. So uh, the main paper, so the Feynman category paper finally got uh, put on the archive two days ago, so you can read all about it now. It took a few years <laughs> only. <laughs> so this is actually, in a sense, the examples have been on the archive for a year now. It's just that the theory has been lagging behind. So this is the theory for the examples. And so the motivation was uh, kind of uh, Gerstenhaber and BV equations uh, coming from either modulized space setups or uh, then uh, from physics. All right, uh, so uh, what, is, what is this goal of Feynman categories? What is it supposed to do? So they're supposed to give you a lingua universalis for operations and relations. Uh, which include all such known gadgets as examples, so that's a good sentence. I'll show you what kind of gadgets I mean by that and how this should work as going through the examples. Uh, and uh, the, you know, one of the good things is that you, then you can do uh, um, algebraic constructions, universal constructions once and for all. So usual examples are like proper ads, proper ads, this, that, and the other. And you can, you can do these things once and for all and you're done. So applications, so this is the background theory where you can do these universal constructions. So uh, people then ask, what, are, what is that good for? So what you want to actually do is, and this was sort of the SQL paper, you want to find out something about the geometry of something else by looking at operations on them. But it can happen that you have zillions of operations and you kind of have to organize them and see how they fit together and what kind of information you can extract and what kind of information follows from having these operations. So part of the universal uh, constructions we will do is say you have a lot of operations, like an operat full, then you get some smaller class of operations like just the Lie algebra, which is better handled, handleable. All right, so I'll talk about that. Uh, so this is the plan. I'll give a warm up because uh, so it goes like this. It's always difficult to give this. So I could start with the examples and then give the definitions. But then I'd have to define all the examples and people would ask me what's the definition of the example. So unfortunately, the examples will be pretty much at the end. The geometry will be in the very end, but if you fall asleep, you should wake up. There will be some plectic and stuff at the end in moduli spaces. In the meantime, I'll do a warm up just to get you ready for the category language, which is in, in, uh, in section two. And then I'll just give you the definition. And that's actually the beauty of it. This is what I want to say too. It's after sort of distilling this, this categorical framework, that's what it is and was built for something, but it might be very useful for other things as well. And this has no mention of operads or anything in it. So you'll see that. And then I'll give you the examples and go to the universal operations and look at these master equations. So those are the applications that are in the paper uh, from 2012. So uh, what do I mean by operations and relations? So let's start with something simple. Say I have an associative algebra that has one operation, multiplication. Okay, this is for this, I wouldn't really need operads, but so this is a simple example. Then what kind of relation would I have? It's an associativity equation. Okay, that's a relation for the multiplication. So how can I think about this? Now, I sort of want to forget that I have this A, so it's all about forgetting the letter A. Namely, so what do I have? I have this mu, which is a two linear thing, and I can rewrite the associativity in this strange form. So people that know operads will recognize this immediately, but I did this for people that don't know operads. So uh, what it means is, so what do I see? I have here, I multiply A, B together first, and then C, so that means I have a multiplication, which I do first, and I insert the uh, result of that multiplication into the first variable, and then multiply it with the second. And here what I see, I have a multiplication first, and I take the result of that multiplication and plug it into the second variable, and do that multiplication. So this is a nice way of encoding this. So I can look at this, so I wrote out the details here, so it's mu, Mu is just the multiplication, so all that happened was I put in the mu. But then you see that on this left-hand side, now I have exactly what I was talking about. I have an operation mu, and I have a relation for this operation mu. I don't have any variables anymore or anything like this. And, you know, I can do more once I have this, and of course I can iterate. I can write down all bracketed expressions by plugging in, plugging in, plugging in. So I get a lot of, a lot of uh, n-linear functions, which take, say, a tensor, just by starting with an, with an associative algebra. So this is, even if you start with one operation, you'll generate a lot of operations, actually infinitely many. If I can multiply two elements, I can multiply n elements. And I get a lot, uh, uh, there's, there's something else I can do. I have a permutation action, namely I could have switched my A and B entries. And that's also just something which is completely, you know, it doesn't really depend on the elements, it just says switch. So I get these switch things. 
So what do I have? So I have a permutation action on these iterates. And so I have all these, uh, so basically these relations tell me that there is one n ary guy if I fix the order, but the n factorial n ary multiplications if I don't fix the order. So, and then uh, this is given by this n with this uh, Sn operation. So this is what I get just by generating with mu and the transposition. I get n factorial elements where I already uh, quotient it out by these equations, right? So it's uh, taking the free algebra and quoting out by the subset algebra. And here's a second warm-up example. So this is because I, I'll, I'll, I'll do everything in terms of categories and functors. So how does this work? So one thing that people like to look at is uh, representations of a group. So how can I do a representation of a group? And the formalism I will do will be very similar in terms of category language. Again, many people have probably seen this in the board, but for the people that haven't seen this, it might be fun. So what do you do? You take uh, the category with one object and morphisms G. So what does that mean? So I just have one object and I have an abstract morphism G here. Then, uh, then if, I, if I have morphisms, I'm supposed to be able to compose them, but this is where my multiplication comes in. The composition of morphism is just multiplication of elements. Uh, it's associative, so I'm lucky because there's supposed to be morphisms. And uh, I have inverses, uh, which means that G is a groupoid. That's actually the definition of a groupoid that every morphism is invertible. So I have a group void with one element. And now what's a representation? A representation is a functor rho from this underlying g to vect. And so, so what do I do? I, why is this a functor? And this is actually kind of nice. So I have rho, and, and so what does it do? I have rho of the star, so maybe by vector space v, and the action is rho of g on this vector space v. And this is actually kind of nice because that sort of, it, it, it's, you know, when you learn group theory, you always say it's a pair of rho and v and rho is a morphism. So you actually more or less already know that actually even if you define it without using the word functor, you're actually defining a functor because v is the functor on the underlying objects and the operation in n and v are the morphisms. And so uh, what's our kind of universal constructions that you can do with this? If you have a subgroup h and v or if I have a morphism of, of h going to v, I'll get a functor on just by doing that on the morphisms. And what I can do is I can certainly pull back, that's restriction, but I can also push forward. That's categorically not that easy. You have to, it's a, it's a left con extension. You can actually compute it, it's kind of a nice thing. And what I didn't put in is I can also, another universal construction would be, I could take, uh, if I have this, I can uh, look at co-invariance and invariance on the space, and these are also categorical constructions. They're limits and co-limits. So all these things that you usually do are just limits, co-limits, con extensions, push forwards, pullbacks. All right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take generalize all this setup to something very much more complicated, but I can do the same stuff. That's the idea. All right. Questions about this? OK. So uh, then we can just get that down to the definition. So uh, the Feynman category, and this is maybe why it took three years, I got it down to three pieces of data and three axioms. There used to be more. So uh, the three pieces of data are the following. I take a groupoid V. This is going to be the symmetries of the theory. Uh, then I take a symmetric monoidal category F. That's the, that's the meat part. And uh, of course, I have to relate them so there's a functor from V to F. OK? So if you're a purist, I could say it's one piece of data, a functor. But yes? Yes, it's a groupoid, and it usually does. But we'll get back to that. But what is the, sorry, how do I ask the, the Yes. What is, what, what is a groupoid? A groupoid is a category in which every morphism is invertible. Okay. So it's like, yeah. So if you, it's exactly this picture, except that you might have something, you know, you might have another object, and you'll have everything here is an isomorphism, but this guy also has to be an isomorphism, has to have an inverse. All right, so uh, then this is, this is notation. So that's my data, and, and I'll get this. So since, since you see, this is a lot slightly asymmetric. This is just a group point that's a symmetric monoidal category, OK? I'm, I'm asking the same question. What, is, what, is, what do you mean by symmetric Ah, uh, so that means that, um, <laughs> uh, so that means 
So let me give an example and then give the definition. So uh, a vector with tensor product, that's a symmetric monoidal category. So what does it mean if I have two objects, two vector spaces, okay, I can associate to that the tensor product. So, uh, so the first thing would be I have something from F cross F to F, which is called tensor product, okay? And then you have to be a little bit careful. This should be associative, but that's, that's not, I mean, you know, you need some morphisms from F tensor V tensor U to uh, V tensor W tensor U. So this is part of the data. So it, if, if you write down what it is, it's about, it's about a page's data. But in principle, what you have for vector spaces or for actually is topological spaces is Cartesian product. You have a tensor product and sort of you can, it's, it's not quite really associative, but only for a stupid reason there's an isomorphism between them. And uh, uh, the, the thing with the tensor category is that nobody says that it's supposed to be a stupid reason. So you could give that it's supposed to be a stupid reason, like rebracketing. Here, here the isomorphism is really, really easy, right? It takes this bracket to that bracket, but it could be more complicated. That's, that's, the, that's the mileage you get out of that. So that's what a tensor category is. And symmetric means that I can also interchange. So uh, I can still do this in vector spaces. So I need something where I can interchange the two, the two objects in the category. And that, that is even not as easy. If you take graded vector spaces, for instance, you get a sign when you switch things. You get this cultural sign when you start switching things. So it means that I can write tensor products of objects and pretty much the bracketing doesn't matter. That's the theorem of McLean. Uh, but, I have, and, but I have to say how to also how to switch them. Okay, and then since this is a universal thing, uh, I know that there's some universal thing which is called a free symmetric category. I won't define that, but that's just a universal guy. I'll say it's, what it is is basically words. Right? You take objects and you write a word in these objects. That's what it is. And I'll give you examples in a second. It's just words in these objects. And since this is uh, monoidal, this functor will uh, um, factor through the functor i upper tensor. It should be i upper tensor. All right. And now I'll give the definition and then the rest will be examples, okay? So the definition is just this, so a triple, just like we saw before. It's called a Feynman category if you have three axioms. The first one says that uh, the functor I tensor gives an equivalence of symmetric monoidal categories between V tensor and ISO F. So this is the category F with just its isomorphisms. So V was a groupoid, then the free symmetric monoidal category is a groupoid. So if I have a functor, it preserves isomorphism. So an isomorphism must go to an isomorphism. So it must land in ISO F. And so what this is saying is I know what the objects look like. They're just tensor products of simple objects. You can think like group theory, right? It's like if you had something like uh, the finite group, you, the, all the irreducible representations uh, generate the representation, something like that, right? Uh, but it's just an abstract property. And then uh, number two is the one that, that really is, that's the, that's the kicker, that's, that's the thing that's uh, important. So, uh, and so let me just say number three first, this is just a technical condition that the comma category is essentially small. So if you know what that means, then good. If you don't know what that means, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, it's a technical assumption so I can take co-limits. So that's not, so let's discuss the interesting thing so what, 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 uh, what does it say? So the first one says that equivalence of categories means that if I have an object on the object level, every object is isomorphic to a composition of simple guys. So I like to call these V simple objects, right? So it's just a tensor product of guys from V. And if I have a morphism from just any morphism in F, it can be decomposed. Usually there is no reason. If you think about vector spaces, if I have some, some morphism, it's not clear that I can decompose it. Right? But how do I decompose this? I, I, I want to decompose in the following way. So I decompose this uh, X prime. I give me this, uh, I take this decomposition. Then there should be XVs. These XVs are in F. So they're, they're just of general things. They're not in V. They're just any objects of F. Such that uh, I have a tensor product decomposition of my, of my morphism with exactly the same index set. Okay? That's the condition. And so what does this look like? So what I, so um, maybe I'll do the first example. Yes? Yeah, and chosen isomorphism here. And the, 
Uh, that's the that's the decomposition. Star v is in, in I didn't didn't, uh, didn't I write it. Star v is just some element in, uh, there exists. Uh, so you choose an isomorphism. Star v is in v. Ah, sorry. Oh, there's a typo. Yeah, this should be x prime. In v. No, any any. So you choose a decomposition. It's an equivalence of categories. So I pick an object x prime. I know it's isomorphic to some decomposition of objects coming from v. That's it. I choose such a decomposition. Okay, and that will have some, some elements in there. Yeah, sorry, there is a prime. Yeah, that's the danger if you give the talk the first time with the things. All right, other questions? Let me give an example and then flash back to the slide. Here's a, here's a good example, which, is, uh, which actually does play a role. This is not why it was invented, but this does play a big role. So let, let's take, a, let's take a, a simple example. Uh, let's survey this uh, category of finite sets with subjections. So objects are finite sets, morphisms are subjections. Uh, the monoidal structure is disjoint union. Take two sets, it's the monoidal structure. So let one be the, the and let one be the trivial uh, category with just one object, let me call that star, okay? And uh, it has to have an identity, that's it. Okay, so uh, actually you get something interesting out of this. So, so, so this will be my V. So what is I tensor? I tensor is equivalent to the category with just objects, the uh, natural numbers. And how should I think about that? So a natural number, I think of the set one to N, right? And this is just, uh, let, let one be I star of, I can, I don't, I have, that, that's, that's my name, say this is my functor I, which sends the object star to one. Could be any other one element set, that's not important. And then if I take disjoint union of uh, one n times, this is actually the same set as where I wrote equal, it's isomorphic. Right? I mean one, 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 it's just an n element set, that's my equal one to n. So then uh, what are the isomorphisms in this category of subjections? Well, they're, they're the permutation, they're the, sorry, they're the isomorphisms. But uh, any, so I, this is fully, so uh, what I get here as the image of this well, now I have to say, I'll say categorically, and then I just get the skeleton, and the isomorphisms are Sn, right? So any object is isomorphic, so I get the, the equivalence of categories, right? Because the, uh, the uh, category of finite sets is equivalent to the category of just n, uh, the n element sets 1 to n with Sn, with Sn action as isomorphism. That's isosurrections. And what's this decomposition? It, this is sort of, I hope I did this right. So yeah, if I, if I uh, and I, I messed it up again, this is supposed to be T. So if T is, um, T is isomorphic to, oh, that's terrible. T, this is terrible. So T, if T is isomorphic to, if T is isomorphic to one N, so that's my decomposition, then uh, what I do is I just take the fibers of the map F. So this is the disjoint union of the fibers F to the minus one of I, where I run through these things, and that's decomposition. So uh, let me draw a picture of that, and uh, let me not erase this picture, okay? Please help me not to erase this picture. So what happens, let me draw it this way. So I have a map from, say, from M to N, and the way this is supposed to work is I have copies here, N1, or maybe let's call it from N to M. Then it's M1 up to MN. And these map here, and these map here, and these map there. Okay? That's the picture. And that's the, that's the general picture. This picture is good. Okay? So this is, <laughs> so this is a nice example. Okay, and now, now example, so this is actually something which will maybe come up later. So this is a non-trivial example. Although it sounds like I'm not doing much. All right, uh, I need one more definition and then I can uh, go through the examples and see what this does. So uh, what I do now is, so it, let me say what this is good for, right? I, I announced this as something like being about operads and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, I don't have operads yet. How do I get operas? Operas will be functors from this category. That's the, the generalization of operas will be functors from Feynman categories, okay? So functors to what? So I, I take a, a, another a symmetric monoidal category C and my Feynman category F, and now I look at strong symmetric monoidal functors 
uh, from f into c. And I'll call them f ops in c. Sounds like opera. Could be a prop, could be anything. And v mods is just regular functors from the underlying symmetries to c. All right? So uh, what kind of universal things can you say? So this is now at the moment still just pure category theory, in a sense. If I have, since, this, since I have the inclusion of this uh, functor i from, from v to f, I can restrict any, any functor from f to c to, uh, to v. That's a forgetful morphism from one functor category to another. And the first theorem you can actually prove is that this has a left adjoint, a free functor. So now, now actually I have, for instance, free operads, free props, free this, free that, free, free modular operads, free cyclic operads, free anything. I don't have to do a separate construction. I have a left adjoint free. And it works because of condition two. So, yeah. So it's, it's the Kahn extension, and then you have to check that the Kahn extension is monoidal, and it's monoidal precisely because of this condition two. So anything you prove goes back to condition two. All right, so uh, one of the things that you're probably maybe, or something after, uh, and why is this called Feynman category? So a Feynman category might evoke the idea of Feynman graphs. So you might think that examples have to do something with graphs, so, but the, cat is, so the important thing to say is the definition of the category has nothing to do with graphs. There were no graphs. So I, re I refrained from doing graphs as an example. But of course, graphs should be an example. I called it Feynman after all. So how does this work? And this slide is, I'll show it to you, but more like an advertisement. If you ever work with graphs and you want to really do calculations, Borisov and Mannion uh, invented a really great category of graphs. This is uh, one of the nicest gadgets I've found for handling all the, all the things you would ever want to do to graphs. Okay, and it's, it's kind of, it's, uh, so the first one you can find already in other things. So for a, a graph is just a tuple of flags, vertices, and uh, a boundary map and an involution. So uh, what you're thinking is that if, if I want to draw down a graph, and this is, uh, can you see? Yeah, I guess here's fine. Uh, you, you would sort of give the vertices of the graph, and flags are half edges. And then what else would you, you'd have to say where these flags, actually that's the map, this flag is adjacent to that vertex, this one to that vertex. And then finally you'd have to say, well, if I have edges, I'll just connect, I'll just connect some some flags of my graph to some other flags of my graph, something like this. Doesn't have to be planar. So that's this thing. And uh, then I could have things left over, which I'll call tails. That means they, they don't get paired with anything. So, and then the question is, what is the graph morphism? And this is really, that's the thing that they had new, which, is, which I really love. It's a, it's a triple, where uh, if you have two graphs, uh, you have a push for, you have a morphism on vertices going in the direction you would think, maybe from vertices of the first graph to the vertices of the second graph. And you have a pullback from the flags that goes the opposite direction you would think. And then there's this, there is this very mysterious piece of additional data, which is sort of a flag gluing. It glues flags that disappear, okay? So let me, let me, let me do an example and tell you why this is good. So one thing you would certainly want to do is if you have two uh, vertices, I'm going awfully slow, am I? Uh, yeah. So one morphism I would maybe love to do is I would, maybe this is, this is too much, uh, one, two, three, four, one, one, two, three, four, maybe I would put in an edge. So then it would be just the vertices go to the vertices, and the bad map flag backwards would be these three flags go to this one, this one goes to that one, and this one goes to that one, okay? And uh, this mysterious component would be nothing. But then what I could do is I maybe also want to contract the edge, so I can do this. So now I contracted the edge, so what is it? These two vertices now map to that vertex, and these three flags map back to these three flags, these three flags map back to these three flags, but the two flags of the edge have disappeared because I contracted them. And so this additional piece of information says any flag that has disappeared has been contracted as an edge, okay? And the thing is, of course, now, see, if I, if I draw a morphism like this, because I can compose morphisms, now you see why you need this additional piece of data, because you didn't know what flags, you know, which flags disappeared now. If I go, just go from this to this, if I don't tell you which two flags I paired and, and contracted, you will never find out. Okay, so that's, that's the definition of these things. And, of course, so, uh, and uh, what I will be dealing with is sort of, it's interesting, so I sort of get this ghost graph, I call it the ghost graph. So if I look at all the flags that disappeared, 
they all have to get paired. So this gives me a graph. So that's the ghost graph. So the, the ghost graph here is sort of becomes, so the graph itself here from this, so for this morphism, th this graph, the same graph here is the ghost graph. That's the, if I just go from here to here, I say I glued these two edges and contracted them. So in that case, in, th in this way, more, uh, actually this is the very important thing. So um, the way Feynman categories are set up, it, if you have examples dealing with graphs, the graphs are morphisms, not objects. The objects are actually just stars. They're just agglomerates of corollas. Okay, and once, and then uh, the graphs come in as the ghost graph of these morphisms. So you see that this is a morphism just from a corolla, which means uh, so a corolla is a one vertex, no edge uh, graph. An aggregate is a is a disjoint union of these, and this is one map like this. All right, and now I'm done. See. Yes. This was to, 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 to give a, get, get a Feynman category. Oh yeah, sorry, I didn't say that. So the point is that if I take a subcategory of this category of graphs. What, what, what is this? Why would this, this advantage for operators? For operas, for generalizing operas. And they almost succeeded except that they are one category, category level too low. They took the graphs as objects, not as morphisms. So what I did is more or less a categorification of this and then it actually works out. Uh, no, this was motivated by generalizing operads, props, so and so on and so on. Uh, how does Feynman get into it? Um, yeah, th th so sort of through the functor. So Feynman, the, the way I think about it is sort of um, basically something like this. Uh, so you have an endpoint function which is blank, and that is supposed to be a doodle for, for an endpoint function. So the way you would think about this is as an endpoint function, but it doesn't have anything in it yet. So if I, but if I start fixing functors, then the thing what I might want to write down is fields phi 1 to phi n, and then this might be phi 1 to phi n. And then I sort of, but then I can write down sort of, so how do I get, and then I could look like an S matrix kind of thing. So if I have a target, if this thing is a target, so I have a morphism, say, of graphs, say this complicated graph, to something like this, okay, then I would say, well, this is, this is some, so this is a piece of the endpoint function here, which comes from the interaction here, where, the, where I fix the outside fields to be whatever the fields were. So that's how, that's, how, that's, that's how I look at it. So these stars are sort of the effective, these are the sort of the S matrices, and these, these give you the components of the S matrix, which okay. map into the S matrix. So maybe in my way, that might be an effective vertex. Yeah, right, exactly, it's an effective vertex. That's what it looks like. And then if you expand the effective vertex, you get all the things. No, that's the thing. So there, you know, there, there are several levels here. I'll get to algebras in a second. So this is just saying that you know, when you say effective vertex, you don't have a theory yet. I'm at that level. And the astonishing thing is, see, this is the astonishing. I can say something at that level, and then this will work regardless of what theory you're doing. That's 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 the power of this. This is very far where you haven't specified anything yet. Right. So saying that I have a Feynman category just means that you know, I have something that I, that I could write down in action, I have some sort of interaction vertices, but I'm not even telling you what. Yeah, you're not saying anything about no, I'm not saying anything about it, except that I want this thing that sort of, you have in renormalization, that if I have a vertex, I see in this effective thing, right? So, so you know, about dyson Tringer equations or something like that. So if I see in this effective expansion, I see a vertex, I can plug into that vertex again. And that's this hereditary condition, this condition two. That means that if I see something, I could plug it in, plug in there and expand it, re-expand it out. That's what's going on. But see, you don't need to know this. It's just, a <laughs> it will help, but it's just a definition about a category. Okay, I'm, I'm so, you see I'm getting giddy, but I, I really like this because it just works for so many things that you didn't expect it to work for. So, and the, the remark here, thank you for reminding me, I didn't say this, the theorem here is, if I take the subcategory where I just have aggregates, just see stars, and look at morphisms from stars to stars, that's a Feynman category. Not the full category of graphs, that won't work. Just this subcategory, okay? And now I can define all the objects you ever, you ever wanted, operands and so on, in one slide. Uh, Corolla is a, is a graph with one vertex and no edges. Half edges, tails, yeah. Right, that's, that's it. 
So you know, as you said, an effective vertex, just external, external lines. <coughs> All right. And there you go. So uh, the ops will. Uh, so so if you if you're after the classical objects that um, this is meant, meant to generalize, what you do is you go to this category of graphs, and you restrict sort of the graphs you allow, the ghost graphs you allow. If your ghost graphs are trees, basically you get cyclic operads. Then if you want operads, your ghost graphs should be rooted trees, but then the corollas should also be rooted. Okay. If you take props, then all you have to do is you have to take corollas with ins and outs and have directed graphs. If you want modular operands, you just take corollas, take a genus function on them as well, and just take any graph. So it's really nice. So any type of, so, so this could go on, you know, NC modular operands, uh, wheeled props, pro the proper ads and whatever. It's just you massage, you give conditions on the, um, on the, gra on the ghost graphs. That's it. And so now, now actually it's the first time you can say that all these operatic-like things are exactly the same. You know, there's a term for it. They're just, ca you know, they're just functors from Feynman categories. Yes? Both. It's conditions and extra structures. Okay. So if directed is an extra structure, okay. rooted will be an extra structure. You fool around with extra structures and conditions. Okay. So see, this is uh, goal one. That's so I have all these things. Um, so you could ask about algebras. This is where you come in. You know, this is the first thing. Then you know how to flesh it out and how to get correlation functions. You should get a vector space of field in there, and this is how you get this vector space of field in there. So uh, algebras over operators. This is a little tricky. Uh, to talk about algebras over an operator, you have to fix <coughs> some standard functor. So some standard operad. So you know, an algebra is over an, actually an algebra over an operad. What is it? It's it's uh, it's an uh, operad morphism from your operad to this hom operad to multilinear functions. Okay. So in general, you can do algebras in this generality, but you'd have to specify something a standard functor from an object in your category, depending on an object in your category. So for props, it's you know it's hom of uh, v tensor or x tensor n to x tensor m. You have to give me something. For cyclic operands, it's a, it's a hom of uh, x tensor n to x, but then you also have to have a duality from x. If, as long as you have a standard thing, then algebras over these guys will be uh, functors between, uh, sorry, a natural transformation between two functors. So that's, and then that's the full setup when you have sort of a field theory. That's all you need. So you need the space of fields. You need the way the correlation functions will actually do this standard representation for you. And then, then you have all these operations. All right. Uh, what else can you do? So this is, uh, you can do enriched versions. And this is also important. Um, so but up to now, I've just been talking about categories. So the morphisms were like morphism sets. I might want my morphism sets not to be sets, but vector spaces, say. Right or topological spaces, and I can do that. That can be done. This is important if you uh, want to do uh, what are called modular operands, which you do need for many things like brackets. So this is the first time you can sort of actually treat modular operands and operands the same. Uh, so it's like twisted modular operands and modular operands in the same type of setup. So otherwise, they're really hard to define. Then uh, you can, we can go back to this question. So uh, V can have many objects, but you could ask, well, what if a V is this, uh, the smallest possible I can think about? Namely, just the trivia category. One element, one identity map. We've already done the computation. Then V tensor is basically the natural numbers with uh, SN action. Now, giving a Feynman category with that V, the theorem says that that's the same thing as giving an operad. And uh, you say O of n is this hum, so this has this is not a typo. Depending on how you want it, it's a one-one correspondence. Given an operand, you write hum n one to be this. And then by this axiom that you have decomposition, you know what all the hum m n are, because they just decompose in this sum over the m i uh, to one. And the other way around, you just set this thing to be O n, and then if you go back here, you see that this is exactly. If you go back here and go down to one thing, you see that this is exactly this operad composition that you take. Uh, if you have OM1 up to OMN and tensor that with OM, you get a map into 
you get a map which is the composition, which is a map from m to 1. So that's just. So then, and in this case now, the ops are, so you see, now it starts to be different from what you started with. Because now I'm not giving you operas, I'm getting algebras over operas, actually, as the ops. And uh, you can do a lot of other stuff. So uh, you can do non-sigma versions. The simplicial category is actually a Feynman, Feynman category cross-simplicial group. If you take a cross-simplicial group, that will give you a Feynman category. If you take Fi algebras, yeah, there are no representation theories. So Benson Farb has this wonderful uh, invention of Fi algebras, which he uses for a stable representation theory. So these are basically finite sets with injections. That's also a Feynman category. So this is, this is kind of nice. So it's, the idea was to get something like uh, operates, but you get something more. All right, so what else can we do? What kind of in, in uh, universal constructions can we do? And just like we had, you know, this, so this is why I showed you this group example. Remember, sort of, if I have this functor between the two groups, and I have a functor which is a representation, then pushing forward and pulling back were induction and restriction. I can do the sort of same thing with the full Feynman categories, right? And so I can have I can have induction and restriction with full Feynman categories. So, for people that know these things, so for instance, the the prop generated by an operat, that's a push forward from the ca from the Feynman category of operats to the Feynman category of prop. You can do the restrictions. So anything. So this is very really nice. This is uh, what McLean said. Everything should be a con extension. Everything is a con extension. So all the constructions you can do. So that's one set of constructions. It's like induction restriction. Then another thing you can do is Cobar transforms and resolutions. And I think I have the time. I can, I can tell you something about that, what to th how to think about that. We can do Cobar transforms, bar transforms, resolutions, and Feynman transforms. And um, so this is rather hard because basically what I, what I say, I said something like the word resolution. So for an algebra, you would take a free resolution. But then I said this is a quite general setup. I didn't say anything about linear or anything. So we need some model category structures to say what free resolution should be or what resolutions are as cofibrant objects. We did that. I'm not going to torture you with that. <laughs> but it's in the paper. That's why it's 80 pages of you. If you want that, you can get it at the end. Um, and sort of these Feynman transforms, they're related. So this is, again, something that, that, that we wanted from this paper on master equations. Those are the reasons somehow, what is it? So A, in these master equations, you have brackets and BV uh, operators. So there is a two-part question. One, where do these brackets and BV operators come from? And two, how do I get the master equations? And for that, I need Feynman transforms. And I'll explain that in a sec. And then some four is something uh, which was really surprising. So this is joint work with, uh, I should have said the first thing. I, I, I probably didn't say that. So the Feynman category paper, but it said on the slide, this was joint work with Ben Ward. And uh, this paper, uh, there, is a, there is another paper which uh, we're currently writing up with uh, Ima Galvez Carrillo and Annie Tonks. And I don't have time to talk about this. I talked about this at Princeton University about three weeks ago or something like this. Uh, you can actually get a Hopf algebra from one of these Feynman categories. And the Hopf algebras you get, for instance, for the subjection one, up to a twist is the one for, for, for a Gonshaw pass for multi zeta values. So this simple subjection opera that gives you a Hopf algebra. And uh, that Hopf algebra is basically the Hopf algebra that works because uh, that tells you that every simplicial object has this Hopf algebra structure. It's really cute. All right. So, um, so one question was, it always was sort of a mystery to me how uh, Gersten Haber got his bracket. Or how you get this, you could write it down. For an off, you have an opera, you, you've, see, you've maybe seen that, but I'll go through it. There's a pre D bracket. Where does it come from? And is there some way of general nonsense that I can just produce this? And the answer is yes. And the answer is co-completion. So let me just go through this slide, and then I'll tell you what that means. Uh, so so th this is just a formal thing that you can take co-limits. And uh, it is monoidal, again, by something strange. It has a monoidal product co called the day convolution. So I get a new uh, monoidal category. So this is a good thing to try to build a Feynman category. Now I do one thing. I take one element. So I'll build a Feynman category again with a trivial v. Uh, and I'll take the co-limit uh, over v of my inclusion functor i. The j is just that I go to the co-limit. 
All right? And then there's a theorem which says that if I take the symmetric monoidal category subcategory generated by I in this co-completion, that's a Feynman category. See, it's complete general nonsense. Actually, the theorem isn't that easy to prove. But let's see what this does for us. So I said operads are an example. It's the one where the morphisms are trees, right? Maybe I should have, I should have, uh, well, the, here was a tree picture. So this is, this is, for instance, yeah, so that's a tree. See, this is, a, if I take a root here, then, uh, <laughs> so for operads, so this, this middle guy doesn't exist, but there's a morphism like this, and say here was a root, and here was a root, and then the root may be here, and this is a root of tree, so the morphism is given by a root of tree. So I take a functor, and then, so, uh, what is O n? So here I just say, well, I have this star. I say, let's say I, I, I number the flags 1 to n, and I apply my functor to it. This should be an object, and this object I'll just call, call O of n. That's the n part of the operand. And now what does the co-completion do? So what is O hat of i? So if I go to co-complete category, say, vector spaces, what is it? It's a direct sum of the O n as n co-invariant. That's what it is. And now you can ask, so, so this, is, this is what the functor would do on this i. And now you can ask, well, what in this, in this uh, co-completion, what are the morphisms? And you can compute them. You can just sit down. It's a two-line computation. And you find that there is just, the, the morphisms are just given by this. They're classes of sum of circ i's. That's the only morphism, more or less, right? You have to say how many inputs and how many outputs. But that's the only morphism. And there you go. That's the pre-D structure. So it just popped out. I took the, I took the co-limit, and I found out the universal operation. The only one that is in there is the circ product, which is the pre-D structure. And I get, I get the, by taking anti-commutator, I get a Lie bracket. And there is something, uh, oh, the SN shouldn't be here. So it lifts. Uh, so actually, what Gerstenhaber did was he worked in the non-sigma case, and then you don't take co-invariance. But this is kind of, we can get that back by lifting it. Actually, it's, it's canonical when you're taking a, a symmetric setup. So here's a list. <laughs> just to say that this works, you can go through the list and just start computing. And this pops out the structures you were looking for. If you start with operads, uh, you get, uh, so these are, these, are, these are rooted trees, and uh, the, the, you get the pre Lie operad. Remember, this was a Feynman category with trivial V, and that was an operad. So you get the pre Lie operad. If you start with odd operads, which means that you have rooted trees plus an oriented on orientation of the set of edges, you get odd pre -Li. So if you just take planar, you would get all operations. That's kind of boring. Uh, if you take an operad with multiplication, so this is exactly the setup for Gerstenhaber, uh, sorry, for Delinius conjecture on the Hochschild cohomology. What you do, you do the computation, you get the, uh, the, uh, the Feynman, ca so, you, so you get the operad of black and white rooted trees, and you see that you get pre -Li plus multiplication which is exactly what you need to get this Gerstenhaber. Uh, if you have cyclic, then it's, ca then it's weird. For cyclic, you don't get anything good. You just get some weird commutative multiplication. But if you take odd cyclic, which is you put an orientation on the, on the set of edges, you enumerate the edges, and if you flip to edges, you get a minus sign. If you do that, you get a Lie bracket, actually an odd Lie bracket. And this is something that, uh, so this is one of the things that we discovered with uh, Ward and Zuniga. And there is no pre lee structure. It's just a Lie bracket. Again, you can compute it. You just compute what is the universal operation in there. It's, a, it's an odd Lie bracket. And so if you can sort of do self-gluing, you get odd, odd DG Lie. And, and uh, sort of uh, if, you, if you allow disconnected, so this NC means uh, non-connected. So if you don't allow disconnected graphs, you actually get BV. So this is really nice. What, and what's BV? Batalin uh, last slide. Last slide. Um, and so you can see this is just, I mean, it's a wonder, it, it came from nothing. It's something from nothing. It's just a co-limit. And you can really get exactly the, uh, the operations you want. And it's not a surprise anymore, they're calculable. OK, so here's something I put in for the symplectic people. So some, uh, you know, Konsevich had these three geometries, commutative, Lie, and associative geometries. And how do you get something like this? So I said if you have this odd, uh, where is it? If you have an odd cyclic operad somewhere, odd cyclic operad, you get this odd Lie bracket. How do you get an odd cyclic operad? So this is for symplectic people. You start out with a symplectic vector space V, 
and you look at the endomorphism operat from V to V, but you have this dualization, but the dualization has degree one. So you figure out that that's actually an odd cyclic operat. And now there is a trick. If you take an odd cyclic operat and tensor it with a cyclic operat, you get in, oh, this is, the brackets are wrong. So the brackets around these uh, should be here. So it's, uh, the formula should be O n, sorry, O tensor P n. You just take the naive tensor product. This is O n tensor P n. Then if, if one of the guys is uh, odd cyclic and the other one is cyclic, the tensor product is odd cyclic. It's the same, odd tensor, odd is odd, even, and so on and so on. So you do this for your favorite uh, cyclic operands, com, li, and associative, and you get a Lie algebra. But that's exactly on this co-completion, on the direct sum of the SN invariants. That's where the Lie algebra lives. And if you have a sequence of vector spaces, you can take a limit, and then you get these Lie algebras uh, that uh, Conservers is looking at. So that's kind of nice. So that's an application. That's where you find these things. Uh, and we can do this quite in general. It's not just this list. Uh, we took the pains to write down when you can actually do sort of something odd. When odd makes sense, you have to do a presentation and, and so on. So if you uh, want, I can uh, discuss that. So odd for if you, have, if you have graphs, odd basically means that you have an orientation on the edges. And if you flip to edges, you get a cultural sign. All right? Then. Yeah, I might say I started five minutes late, so maybe uh, I'll, I'll say this. So another type of operation, universal operation, you can do is uh, bar and cobar. So this comes from algebra. So say you have an associative algebra, you might want a free resolution of this algebra. How are you going to get one? So there is a there is a standard trick. So what you can do is uh, it's 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 kind of weird. So what you can do is you can take first of all you can make your algebra into a Sorry, you can take it, so uh, I did it the other way around, but you can take your algebra and make it into a free co-algebra. It's just a tensor algebra with plucking apart. Or if I have a co-algebra, I can make a free algebra, it's just a tensor algebra, and then tensoring together. That actually works. You have to put in signs. You have to shift it once, otherwise it doesn't work. And then if I do this back and forth, so I take my algebra, uh, bar it, then it's a co-algebra, then I co-bar it, it's an algebra again. But this is a DG algebra now because I have differentials. I could have started with a DG algebra. And that's a free resolution. That's the theorem. OK? And I had algebra as a trivial example of what I was doing. So you can ask the question, well, now can I do this for a Feynman category? And the answer is yes. As soon as I have this nice presentation where I sort of know what odd means, I can do it. We can do par bar transforms. We can do cobar transforms. We can do W constructions. For this, we need the model category structure. But this is very powerful. That means that if you have some, some field theory and you're asking, well, you know, what are the relations and how, what is the presentation? What's the re resolution of these relations? You can just do it. So if you want to resolve prop rad, say, plug it in, it's there. OK, this is just like an algebra resolution. So we have free resolutions of these relations. Yeah, uh, the, the one that I like is this Feynman transform. So that's kind of weird. So that usually topologists don't like, but uh, this was invented by Getzler and Caprano for modular operands, and f uh, by Ginsberg and Caprano for, for operands. It's if you have another duality, then uh, you, can only, you can do this in sort of in one step, right? Because uh, what you can do is you can dualize your algebra, and then you get a co-algebra, and then you just can co-bar it. OK? And that's called the Feynman transform. And this is the one that's sort of relevant for physics and master equations. OK? And that I can do. So what, what happens with this Feynman transform, this is this. So if I, if I, start, if I start Feynman transforming an operad, then actually uh, the algebraic structure of an algebra over this Feynman transform will be odd pre -lead. And the Feynman transform, you remember that was sort of a free gadget, right? But it had a differential. So if I look at algebras over a free gadget, that's easy, because it's free. There are no resolution. I just have to give the object. That's it. But if I have quasi-free, that means it's free as an algebra, but not f free differential. So the differential will give me one equation, only one equation. And that equation is the master equation. And now we're back in physics. And the last slide will have, the last slide will have uh, sort of the master equation. So what kind, of, what kind of stuff do we get? So the structure here will be odd pre Lie, and the master equation will exactly uh, have this pre Lie thing. If I start with a cyclic operand, I'll get odd Lie, and I'll get this equation, which you might recognize as the maurer Caton equation. That's the obstruction for something over the free operand to be 
an algebra over the dg free, uh, over the final transform, so with the dg. That's this one equation. If you start with a modular operator, see this is where the BV comes in. Uh, you get the, uh, so sometimes this is called the quantum master equation, so you get this Maracarton piece, but you also get this operator delta. And that comes from self-gluing, right? This comes from little loops. Prop ride, you get again get odd pre Lee, wheel prop ride, you get odd pre Lee plus a delta. If you take a wheel, wheel prop, you get a DGBV algebra, and sort of you can, you can go down the list. This is again just now totally general. You just go through, do the Feynman transform, ask what's the equation, you write it out. And these terms correspond to the graphs you allowed, say, if, you do, if you're doing graphs. Okay, so uh, uh, if you see a bracket, so if you see a pre Lee, a pre-lee sort of is an ordered, an ordered way of doing things. It means that you allowed exactly graphs of this type where you have roots. And, and so exactly this type of thing, that will give you pre-lee. If I don't have roots, then I can't tell the difference between this way and this way. I just get lee. If I have, and the delta comes from brackets from things where I do self gluing So that's sort of in the, in the, in the prequel paper, that this is actually just not. All right. So what does this have to do with geometry, and why did I get interested in the first place? It's not that I was born a category theorist. It just happened to be that this was the right language to get this. It's, uh, so what are typical examples? So modular operands. What is it? So you take the linear Mumford compactified spaces. So this is a operand in spaces, MGN bar. You can just take curves and stick them together to get new double points. That's it. You have N marked points, and what can I do? I take a curve with N marked points, and with M marked points, I stick it together at some pair of points, I get n plus m minus two marked points. That's exactly, again, a tree. Or I can take two punctures and make a double point like that. That's the other operation. Then I can go to the, uh, I can go to the homology. So this is also now easy because you know one is a functor from, this, from these graphs to topological spaces. Then I have a functor homology going from topological spaces to uh, DG vector spaces or whatever, you know, great abelian groups. And I compose these two functors, so I see that I get a functor from this Feynman category for modular operands to that, so I get another modular operand. And so, in, and then, then you know, here you can say what it, what it is. So gromov witten invariance give me this gromov witten uh, invariance now give me the functor between between this modular operand and the standard structure of N, N V. And then I know this is an algebra over this operand. And what does it buy me? Well, it buys me recursion relations uh, for gromov witten invariance. That's what it does. I get the, these partial differential equations for the potential, and any equation I can find in H star, so on, then I can, I can do this. Um, and what's the geometry behind these BV equations? So that's the last, that's, uh, I promised you the answer on the last slide. So this goes back to Zen and Zwiebach when they were doing string field theory and trying to get viable actions for string field theory. So they looked at moduli space and, and wrote down some equations. And then Stashev, uh, Kimura, and Voronov tried to come up with a moduli space that would do this for you. So I said, and uh, see, here, here's something really interesting happens. So the answer is the following. I'll give you the answer first and then the explanation. The what are we asking? You're asking what kind of, you know, what kind of gluings govern string uh, field theory. Well, what are the rules? Yeah, what, that's the question. What are the rules? What are the rules? What is kind of, you know, you should have something with surfaces. You should glue them somehow, and then the action should somehow satisfy this uh, quantum master equation. That's what Zwiebach wrote. And now, how can a mathematician think about that? So this is what they thought about. So A, ki surfaces, kind of, so you should have a moduli space of surfaces. So MGN is good. Then you should, but then you have to get to the details, I mean, the gluing, right? I told you in the linear Mumford, you just glue at, at punctures. But for that, actually, you have to compactify, right? Otherwise, it doesn't work. So after you, after, you, after you did that, so what they did is they, they took a real blow up. So what that means is after you glue that punctures, after you glue that punctures, you sort of have to give a tangent vector at each puncture. Uh, I may have, may have already used all three points. Yes, I did. Too bad. So I don't have to erase. So what happens here is that uh, before you could sort of have just a double point, say, like this, and some punctures here and something here. So this would be just a picture in M, G, N bar. But if you draw the same picture in MGN bar KSV, what you have to give here is a pair of sort of, well, let me write, uh, yeah, I, actually the usual way people draw it is sort of a pair of tangent vectors and there's an angle theta and S1 between them. 
So that's the real blow up. Every time you have a node, you have to have, there's a circle over this node. And this sort of has to do with, like, that's exactly the problem. So if I glue two things and I don't do it topologically, I get a twist parameter for the gluing, actually. And that's this S1 twist parameter. So it's just a mathematician's way of saying, what in the world are we gluing? You get this twist parameter. So that's what's going on at the topological level. Now you go down to chains or homology, then actually, so you don't have a well-defined operation, right? Because you have this twist parameter, you'd have to specify the twist parameter as well. And then the usual thing is, well, why don't I take all twist parameters and I get an S1 family? Now I go down uh, one level to chains, then this S1 family adds degree one. And then now I draw the same pictures as before, namely the gluings are given just by graphs. At each vertex I set my curve. Each, each edge means I have a double point. But now actually I have an S1 gluing, so actually the edge has degree one, which is what I promised. And so this, is, this gives me an odd structure. And then sort of the uh, equation that Zwieback wrote down for a sensible action, and don't ask, don't ask me to explain why that was his equation, but he says a sensible equation for this is giving by ds plus one half bracket s with itself plus delta s is zero, which is the quantum master equation. And I can tell you, I can tell you from a mathematician point of view what this equation means. It means I'm looking, I'm talking about curves. I want a compactification of the space of curves. I need the fundamental classes for these things. These fundamental classes should behave nicely. Namely, they should give me the gluings that I want. And this, so if S is the fundamental class, DS is the boundary of this space. And this says that the boundary of this space should come from the gluings I'm putting in. So in the linear Mumford, it means that the boundary is given by, by uh, the two, two types of divisors where I, have no, where I have double points that separate and, and double points that don't separate. So, uh, but there's this additional thing that you want it to be odd to get this gerson hauer bracket. All right, I think that was it, yeah. So what, what's next? One can uh, try, so I'll have to talk to Nick. I think there are you know, these Feynman categories, so, so the operations you're looking for, there should be some odd, even versions of something that doesn't exist yet. It's not modular operators, it's something, it doesn't exist, but I'm pretty sure in these Feynman category things, we can write that down, whatever it is. And that, that will tell us what's going on. Then uh, I didn't talk about Hopf algebras, but for these Hopf algebras, I mentioned uh, Goncharov. So there is a there is a Grothendieck Teichmuller uh, group floating around. There is also uh, work by Wilbacher where he gets this Grothendieck Teichmuller space on a certain graph complex, and that's in this theory. This is one of those co-limits, so one should be able to see the Grothendieck Teichmuller space. So then something strange happens, uh, Grothendieck Teichmuller group, and it's actually so. Uh, there's something strange because I don't know, so usually you would get these things by looking at automorphisms of fiber functors. I don't see where the fiber functors are. But I do get all the Hopf algebras that people get when they're looking at fiber functors. So it's weird. So Gonchakov gets all these Hopf algebras looking at fiber functors. I get all these Hopf algebras from Feynman categories, and they're the same. The same set, so it should be somewhere there. And uh, so uh, this is a recent preprint by Quichlu and Morava. They looked at the stable symplectic category, and they get a GT, GT action on that. And since it's a symplectic geometry seminar, so I spent the day yesterday talking to Nito uh, about this. And I think it's the, same, it's the same underlying principle. The way you get GT should be from, from just these combinatorial things that you have these various operations on this very abstract level. And yeah, well, dot, dot, dot. I should stop here. Thanks.